There's always been an innovation economy, and J.P. Morgan has an entire business dedicated to helping it thrive. By bringing together founders, startups, investors, and ideas, J.P. Morgan's Commercial Bank helps empower thousands of high-growth companies, companies that are shaping the present and the future. With tailored banking solutions and a global business network, J.P. Morgan helps innovators scale for today and tomorrow. Visit jpmorgan.com forward slash startups to find out how they can help you build your future. Products and services of J.P. Morgan Chase and & Company and its affiliates are subject to availability, eligibility, and applicable terms and policies. J.P. Morgan Chase Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Hello, everybody. This is TechCrunch Live, where we help founders build better venture-backed businesses. I'm Brian Heater, the hardware editor at TechCrunch, filling in for Matt Burns, who is out this week to teach a bunch of campers the magic of taut line hitches. Uh, as you may know, we're exactly eight days away from TechCrunch's big robotics event, so what better time to bring together a leading robotics firm and one of their key investors? I'm very excited today to introduce our two panelists. Scott Gravel is the founder and CEO of Inventory Management robotics firm Adabotics. Yuri Kim is a general partner at Forerunner Ventures, who are an early investor in the startup. Uh, they both have some really fantastic stories that I'm excited to dig into over the course of the next hour or so. During today's event, uh, we will also be digging into Adabotics's Series A pitch deck and discussing why the heck anybody would invest in a robotics firm, let alone actually start one. It's, a, it's an extremely arduous task, but if you've got the right ideas, people, and I assume a lot of luck, it can be a wildly fulfilling one as well. And our panelists will be happy to discuss that. Uh, we will also go through some of these struggles and successes of the early days of the company and how the landscape has shifted since Adabotics was founded. Uh, this is our second week on our new platform. You can register right now on GRIP, and it will make it much easier to register and attend future TCL and TechCrunch events, including next week's Roblox event, which I'm legally obligated to mention five or more times in the next week or so. Uh, we are also streaming on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, but uh, please register on GRIP where you can actually ask questions of the panelists and network with other attendees. The link is over on TechCrunch.com, and it should be all in all of the other platforms as well. Uh, we also just made it easier to pitch practice, just fill out the form uh, on GRIP and you'll be added to the list. Somebody will contact you if you're selected. We have a, a number of great robotics events lined up over the course of the next week, tonight at 5 p.m. Eastern time. So uh, exactly an hour after this ends, I'm gonna be speaking with Ohio State University's Dean of Engineering, Ayanna Howard and LittleBits founder and E14 partner, Aya Badir. On Monday at 3 p.m., we'll be hosting a Twitter space with iRobot co-founder Colin Engel. And of course, uh, Thursday the 21st is our all-day robotics event featuring conversations with the U.S. Labor Secretary, Inventor Dean Kamen, executives from Boston Dynamics, Amazon, and many, many more. It's a totally free event and you can register on the site right now. Okay, with all of that out of the way, uh, I'm excited to bring Scott and Yuri on. Thank you both for being here today. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. I'm, I'm excited to have the chat. Yeah, so um, we're, we'll dig into the, as I said before, we'll dig into the Series A pitch deck in a bit. Um, but, but you're actually, I, I want to start with a question around that. As uh, uh, before we look at it, how much of a role, if any, does a presentation like a slide deck ultimately play in your decision to invest in a company like Adabotics? The slide deck itself doesn't necessarily play a role other than to help frame what the opportunity is. And there are some founders who can come and in an organized way, just spitball the entire story from start to finish. But at that same time, we're trying to process information. We're trying to understand, listen, remember, you know, context set, like all at the same time. And it's helpful just to have a slide to say, hey, if I'm going to talk about the market, here's a slide on the market, just so that you have a couple other data points. But, you know, the, the presentation's not getting the, the deal done. It's certainly just facilitating you being able to tell that story better. So Scott, the last time we spoke, you said something that's really stuck with me over the past few days. Um, you said that you spent two years trying to find a reason not to do adabotics. It's, it's, that specifically is not something that I hear from a lot of founders, and I've been trying to figure out uh, over the course of the last few days whether that's because it's uncommon or because you're uncommonly transparent about that. <laughs> uh, maybe both. Um... <laughs> Adabotics is my second business. 
the first one struggled for five years and we shut it down. Um, and failure, coming back from failure of some kind is always the biggest challenge. So when I had this idea and my old business, I don't know, you can actually see it leaning against the wall. I used to build longboard skateboards. Um, plug for a product that's no longer available. Um, <laughs> Collector's <laughs> item. Exactly. Yeah. It's um, when I was trying to sell $5,000 worth of skateboards to a skate shop, that's a very, very different problem than trying to sell multi-million dollar automation solutions to Fortune 500 companies. And so the idea of starting this business scared the crap right out of me. Um, and I actually literally went looking for a reason not to do it. But I wouldn't let one of those reasons be that I was afraid. There had to be a reason. The IP wasn't defensible. The technology didn't work, wouldn't work. The customers didn't want it. There was no place for it. Didn't have proper market fit. You know, wouldn't bring value. So I went and spent two years trying to find those reasons. And I never did. Um, so I guess the lesson in this is spend some time validating your idea because you only have so many chances to get it right. And if you pivot too many times and run out of money, there goes the opportunity. So did a lot of that diligence on the front end. And now it was out of fear, out of fear of failure, out of fear of not, not having the right idea at the right time. Um, but I wouldn't let fear be the reason not to do it. Yuri, as, as Scott alluded to, he comes from a a, a very unique background, you know, both in the startup world generally, but, you know, in, in, in robotics specifically, um, how, how important is that sort of robotics pedigree when you're looking at an early stage founder? You know, I'll actually piggyback off of what Scott just talked about because so many founders today want to start their companies because they want to start a company and they're looking for a problem to solve and, any problem is good enough if it stands up to a pitch deck and maybe, you know, a couple of friends not laughing at you when you run the idea by them. And Scott just was so passionate about what the problem was out there. And we understood the problem because at Forerunner, we focus on the modern consumer and commerce landscape. And in 2018, when we invested, it was still very early days where retailers and brands we're trying to figure out how they were going to deliver the experience that you know consumers want. And that means fast delivery. That means cheap delivery. That means all these different things that create a delightful experience that Amazon seems to be able to do, but nobody else can. And so Scott came in and pitched the problem that we all know and the solution we all need. And in that regard, we were, we were most impressed with his vision we ended up getting the introduction through a retail partner that he ended up working with um, in, in those early days for a, a proof of concept. And we leveraged their um, technology team and sort of uh, inventory and supply chain team to diligence the early concepts. Um, but ultimately I wasn't backing a robotics company. I was backing a new platform to support modern commerce. And however he was gonna get that done the vision made a lot of sense and we knew that it was going to take a lot of time to figure out, but Scott was the person that we wanted to back. So at, at that early stage, I mean, you know, it, it is ultimately a robotics company. It is a company that, that builds robotics and, and that is the solution. And the robots um, aren't the hard part, my friend. <laughs> Scott, do you want to chime in right there? The robots are great. They work great. Right? We're, we're, we're a solutions. We're a solutions company. Robots are part of the solution, mm -hmm. but the broader solution is rethinking supply chain, changing legacy installed infrastructure to match modern consumer behavior. It's change management. It's racking in bins and real estate. It's it's people in the WMS world. WMS software. That was yeah. what, you know, WMS software. WMS so yes, software. Integration, integrating your front end consumer experience with now data analytics tools on your back end. Supply chains have always been, you know, excuse the expression, but the bastard stepchild of every organization, um, you know, that, that the front end became very easy for retailers to create a buying experience. 
and supply chains have struggled to live up to that expectation now set by the digital experience that the consumers got. So yes, we build robots, but we build robots as part of an overall holistic solution to address the challenges of modern commerce fulfillment. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe that's uh, a lesson there for the, for yeah. the group is, you know, we often get pitched a robotics company or a technology company or a subscription business or whatever you want to call the thing that seems the most kind of um, the word that you want to use. But ultimately, what problem are you solving? For whom? And it's a commerce solution for retailers and brands to serve their customers better. And whether you do that from a robot or not a robot, it kind of doesn't matter, but it's the solution that you need. Okay, so let, let, let me rephrase. So, so a, a a solution company that that happens to build robots. The my my broader question here, though, is, um, you know, when when you're looking, I mean, this is kind of a question for both of you, actually, Scott. When when you are filling, you know, that C level team and you're looking for for partners early on, and you know, Yuri, I assume that you know, if you're an early stage investor, you're playing some role in that. Um, you know, like, w what are you looking for in terms of partners, you know, and, and, and who are the first, who are the first people you bring onto the company to, to help build out that vision? Well, the first group, the first team, and I was actually reflecting on this earlier today with a board member of mine, um, were people that could build the technology to a point that proved it worked. And, but that was just the technology piece, you know, like the anchor of what we do is geometry and automation. Um, so who can make that work? Who can prove that this is viable? Um, then once you move from automation, you got to move into intelligence, you know, and then it's a whole different group to understand, you know, the, the software, the data, the communications, you know, side of this, then it's understanding the consumer. And then it's understanding how do we now go from a R&D business through commercialization kind of organization and now into an execution company. And most of that, and most of our focus now on the leadership side is around the execution of this. How do we manage change management or customers? How do we make sure that we keep expectations set? How do we manage the project through from initial kind of scoping through to completion that you, have, you demonstrate the value to the consumer? Um, and these are all very different businesses. And, and not everybody that was great at prototyping mm -hmm. is great at executive change management at the organization level. And so in the early days, I think I had a strong team that could build the first few robots and prove that the robots would work. And then you go through how do you commercialize this into a finished product? And how then now how do you start marketing, deploying it? Um, and these are all the biggest learnings for me is these are three different businesses mm -hmm. at three different stages. And, and layer on top of all of that, that all of the customers Scott and the Adabotics team are working with, there's no ability to fail. Like this is their system of record, the most important part of their entire company. You can't mess it up. So how do you go from the robot that's in the you know back shop that has been tinkered with that works to fully commercialized technology solution? And I think that's the biggest challenge for all the founders that are on this call is that you guys picked a really difficult space, but as a result, you know, it, it's worth, it's worth diving into and it's worth getting um, all the innovation there sparked. For, for Yuri, for you specifically, you know, I, I, I like to ask VCs, especially ones that, you know, get on a fairly early stage with a company what role they they can and should actually play in sort of like helping, but you know both develop this vision. But things you know things like those first couple hires and and you know, obviously the answer varies from from uh, from VC to VC. But you know on your ends with with, with Adbotics specifically, um, how close a role did your team end up playing in that development? Scott, <laughs> that question yeah. was for you, Yuri. I know. Um... You know, look, so when I invested, it was Scott and maybe 15 or 17 people. And there was literally one little robot prototype that worked. It was super early and really, you know, I wasn't misrepresenting myself, my background or forerunners, but we don't have a robotics background. And Scott didn't bring us on board as partners for that. He wanted somebody who understood the mindset of his future customers, who could open the doors, make introductions, help him understand what is he building towards 
because you can build in a vacuum and have technology that works, but where is it going to show up in the end? And once it's there, how can we make sure that people see antibiotics as not just a point solution, but really a, a, a whole new way of delivering services and, and wildly different than ever before. Um, and so that's what we came in to do. And you know, in those early days, you're picking your partner mainly because you need a cheerleader. You need someone to pick up the phone and just unabashedly speak on your behalf, make sure that you know you can you can justify that this is our real team and they're you know working on some real good stuff. Um, and ultimately just open up your network and your Rolodex. And, and I think those are all the things that I tried to do early days. And you know, you do have to ebb and flow because sometimes it wasn't helpful because he was in uh, you know de dev mode and needed to just work on the technology. And so any new customer call wasn't gonna be helpful because he knew he needed to get the product to the next level. And so it's a fluid relationship with your earliest investors. You want somebody that ultimately believes in the vision and believes in you. Um, Cause we've had a, a, a lot of interesting ups and downs, right Scott, over the last few years. Um, and the vision has been the same since the very beginning. And I still a thousand percent believe in it. And I a thousand percent believe in Scott and his team. So certainly the team has changed. In the beginning, you needed generalists, you needed people who could roll up their sleeves, get shit done. Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, and now we have an incredible cast of executives who have deep expertise in robotics, in you know, sales and management, in security in data, like all the different things that we need, but we didn't need that back then um, in the very beginning. To, to quickly follow up on that, you know, at, at the beginning of, uh, of the conversation, I asked, you know, essentially, you know, what, what attracted Yuri, what attracted you to antibiotics, but, you know, let's, let's flip that on its head. And Scott, what were you looking for in a, in a backer early on? Someone that understood the future of modern commerce. You know, there's so many kind of perspectives out there and, and some of them are maybe a herd perspective. There's not that many visionaries that exist in the venture capital world. They just want you, you know, in some cases cut, copy, paste what was successful for, for others. But Yuri and Forerunner on, had a deep, deep understanding of what the future of modern commerce was going to be. They were there defining it through their investments. So, you know, I might be an auto, you know, an automation visionary, but but Yuri's, you know, a, a commerce visionary, understanding the consumer, understanding, you know, digitally native retail brands, understanding what the market was going to evolve into. In, in the macro aspect of what the consumer is going to be looking for and who's going to be selling that stuff. So to pair up with another visionary that understood, had a deep, deep understanding of what the future was going to look like and was there shaping that future, that was key versus someone who I invested on, oh, just copy what these other guys did and do that thing and we'll be fine. Why aren't you copying it? That was never a conversation Yuri and I have ever had. Um, so when you asked how did she contribute in the early days, it you know, certainly was cheerleader, but it was also a great validation that I didn't have to go to 40 different places to understand product market fit. Mm -hmm. Erie intrinsically understood what the market needed. Maybe not the, the, the technical solution to it. That's where me and my team come in. But when we talk about the platform and the service level and the solution set, what, what is needed to drive these, these brands that she had deep knowledge and understanding of and the consumer. So um, she was also, you know, a big part of a therapist, you know, this isn't easy. And having someone in your corner and on your side that wants to help and help isn't necessarily drink, picking out the, you know, the right micro microprocessor for a computer platform. Help is just sometimes just looks like support and and uh, something to bounce these ideas and concepts off of looking for validation. And, and Brian, I think that's the most important thing is if your investor is telling you how to do the crux of your job, there's a lot of problems with that statement, right? You do not want me picking anything in the robot. Now, when I think about those early days, thinking about, hey, Scott, here are your strengths as a leader. Here's who you want to augment your team. Here's how you might think about evolving that organization as it grows through these like very chunky inflection points. That, that's the part that is very much therapist. It's knowing you as a leader, you know, Scott, like where, 
where will you feel the most supported? And ultimately in those early days, like you were CTO, CEO, CEO, I mean, you were like 12 different jobs. And that was actually the biggest concern from our perspective was you're, you're going to burn out. So how do we peel this stuff back? And it's taken years to be able to accomplish that because it's hard to, you know, portion that off from a founder's brain. Um, but very much the earliest backers have to believe in you because if they don't, then you're spending all your time convincing your backer. And how does that help? Julio, if you can actually start uh, rolling the slide deck right now. Um, I mean, Scott, it, it's it's a very interesting story <laughs> what actually- uh, I literally the first slide deck, so it's pretty- Yeah, <laughs> yeah, what, but 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 the, the the inspiration behind the company and, and, and why it was so compelling and why it was something that you needed to convince yourself not to do. I mean, where where were you and where did you sort of stumble upon, I guess the, you know, abstractly the big idea behind behind antibiotics? Well, stumble is a great way to describe it. My background's in manufacturing automation. And so I've helped companies in Canada integrate digital manufacturing strategies. Um, so before that, I was a cabinet maker. So I come from a very practical background. I'm not an engineer. That's, a, that's the first most important part. I'm not an engineer. Um, so I'd actually reached out to Kiva Systems that Amazon bought, now it's Amazon Robotics, um, to use them as part of a manufacturing buffer at the end of a manufacturing line. And I, I'd like to find the receptionist there because I owe her at least a dinner or a bottle of wine. She said, thank you, but we're no longer accepting inquiries and hung up on me. And I was like, who the hell doesn't want my money? And then a quick Google search, I'm like, oh, the company that Amazon just bought for over three quarters of a billion, they don't want my money. I'm like, okay, makes sense. But I'm like, why? I never worked in supply chain really. And I was like, why did they just spend this? What's going on? And just started diving deep into automated fulfillment for modern commerce. And I saw that everything out there was a derivative of a human centric, you know, system. We're two dimensional. We walk on the ground, we drive on the ground. So we need rows and aisles to access goods. And if you think about most automation systems, they're rows and aisles. So I literally said, well, nature's probably got this figured out naively or bravely and then i started watching nature documentaries on youtube and i found a documentary about leaf cutter ants and that was the aha moment because leaf cutter ants build storage rooms around vertical access of their storage goods not horizontal access of people so then i was like well what would that look like so i did up a quick cad model showing what storage like bins or totes or whatever you want to call it would be like in vertical access and and then I did some math and realized it was 12% of the space of the Kiva system and had distinct advantages. So most technology companies built some tech and then go try to find a problem for it to solve. That's not the way we started. Started with a problem and realized that geometry actually bettered the problem. Because there's, there's your two-dimensional distribution of goods in, a, in an each item fulfillment warehouse. That's actually a picture of an Amazon warehouse. If you put it up high and need a ladder to get it, you've lost all efficiency. So it's just acres and acres of stuff. And then, so if we're going to use vertical access of goods to take advantage of ceiling height, how do we create as much densification like an ant colony? Very, very dense. Um, and then how would stuff move around this? So the next was workflow that we figured out. The last thing we figured out was the robot. It started with opportunity advantage, right? Um, and both workflow, storage density, real estate, labor, all of these considerations. And then how do we get the robot to move the bins around in that geometry? Um, so, you know, problem, solution, opportunity. And that's why the slides that I chose, because those are the ones that really break it down. And the opportunity was, well, at the end of the day, we're all in this to actually make money. Venture capitalists are not charitable organizations. Um, so how can we show that there is a big enough market need and there's a big enough opportunity to actually take the time that's going to take and the investment it's going to take to realize this solution set um, for the market? And uh, so this slide I brought up was just the change in consumer behavior versus how far behind automation for modern commerce was lagging, um, which shows that it was growing 30% year over year, but the increase in spend in automation was only 5%. There was going to be a backlog that needs to be filled. And we're feeling that now, you know? So 
the the idea came from rejection um, from manu from manufacturing and realized that that nature actually presented a solution to a very complex problem. So um, actually, if we have the video, this would be a good time to play it if you're able to, Julio, on your end. Um, Yuri, as we're looking through here, I mean, obviously, as you said, the, the pitch deck wasn't what sold you. But you know, now that we're a little removed from this early Series A pitch deck, or, Listen, what, what works? Here, the story. Yeah. Does that not sound like it needs to exist? <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. Right? And, and that's where it was. It We understood the problem from a different standpoint, which is fulfillment costs, supply chain related costs is 18 to 20% of your PL as a retailer. There's no more margin left. Prices are coming down, they're ubiquitous. You've got to compete against Amazon. Where are you going to build profit? Nowhere. And yet your customers want everything faster and demand that if they, if they don't get it, they're going to go somewhere else. So when you have a customer who's so strapped in a corner needing to make change, the bigger problem is, well, wait a minute though, how do you turn one fulfillment center off and then just spin up another one? There's too much transition time, transition cost, transition risk. And the thing that got us that Scott didn't mention necessarily in, in, in that um, overview is that this cube can be as big or as small as you want. So if you wanted to try it with just a handful of your products, you could take a hundred bins, a thousand bins, 5,000 bins. I mean, that system is probably 300,000 bins. So that but, system's about 8,000 year. Oh, that one's 8,000? Yeah. So our smallest solution is 350 bins that so someone tried it and is using it for medical supply and micro fulfillment. Our biggest solution is 190,000 bins. So, so but, you, you can put that in the back of your house, you know, back of your warehouse and just try it out. And that was where we thought, okay, technology is one thing, but how can they use it if they want it, if they are willing to pay for it, but they don't know how to get it started, it's still going to be a no on the sale. So that's where both Scott and Forerunner were thinking about this from a very practical standpoint. Great technology doesn't do anything if you can't implement it with normal people in normal warehouse solutions. And that's been the journey is to say, okay, well, can we get this started, show you that it works, give you trust, train your teams, and then earn the right to build bigger solutions. Yeah, I, I think you put it really well in an earlier conversation we had, this idea of almost like having it off in the corner. So mm -hmm. you can go, you can go through your regular warehouse business and then have that on the side. Um, I, I did want to ask really, you know, quickly, because this is so focused on this deck, um, you know, as you're looking through that series, a deck, although it wasn't what convinced you like what Yuri, what works and what doesn't necessarily work with the deck? You know, I think this one, um, you want me to break down these four slides? Yeah. Okay. Um, go to the next one, Julio. So one thing that founders navigate all the time is trying to figure out if they need to educate the person across from them, the venture capitalist that's, that they're pitching on the market, or if the investor actually already knows about the problem that exists. And I will tell you, if the person doesn't understand the problem, you are very unlikely to convince them in this 30 minute pitch. So that's one place where you can say, what do you know about this space? Like, is this a problem that you also see that you've encountered in your other investments or in your other work? Because he didn't need to pitch me any of these slides, actually, I already know this. But it was a context setting that says, all right, we're all on the same page, yeah. talking about this picture right here. This looks inefficient. It doesn't take a genius. It doesn't take a roboticist to say, yes, Scott, I agree with you. Then you go to the next slide, and now you're talking about how do, how do we solve it? And the solution felt wild and imaginative, but it did make generally logical sense. But for us, it was very much, okay, the practicalities of how do you implement it? That was the biggest aha. And you know, I don't know, Scott, if you had a slide on that in the original slide deck, but we talked about it because originally yeah. like we yeah. were like, well, how would you possibly get this started? Like it's, it's just not going to work if someone's got to switch over the whole thing. It's a you know $100 million investment, takes five years to get going. And then by the time you've launched, the technology is old. That's the problem with this industry. Everything takes too long. 
And so, you know, when he started talking about the, the iterations that you could do, that's when the conversation got, you know, much more engaged. So this is very quick to what do we do? And you don't want to take 27 slides to tell you what you're doing, you know, get that out of the way. And I thought that was well done back in the day. Um, and then the next slide was really around the TAM. And every good venture capitalist wants to know, all right, well, how much, how much if we win, how many dollars are at stake? Yep. And it's just unfathomable. If you can fix this and you can scale it out, everybody would want to use this because it's everybody against Amazon. Even Amazon can't beat Amazon anymore. Like they're outdating themselves and they need antibiotics for themselves too. But that's, that's another story, right? Um, but, you know, and, and so there's one part of the story, which is, what do we need to do to get current goods to efficiently go where they need to go in the existing warehouses we have? But then you, and we talked about this, Scott, during that first meeting, what if those warehouses don't need to be in Kansas anymore? They can be in San Francisco, in New York City, because they can be in the back of the house or in your dark store. And that's where it's like, oh, wow, this is all really making sense. And for, for me, as a layperson, not a roboticist, I could figure out a 300 bin system. That doesn't seem terribly implausible. 300,000 seems a little bit harder, but like 300, I can get my head around. And that's how, that's how we grew the idea to ebb and flow where people's heads are at. Because then you talk to a massive multi, you know, hundreds of store retailer, they don't want a 300 bin solution. They want the million bin solution. So poor Scott's team is whiplashing between, can I get a hundred bins? Can I get a thousand bins? And then can I get a million bins? And his answer was yes, because it doesn't matter. It's just more racks and more robots and more bins. But I think what we came across is actually it's the software that's pretty complicated. Yep. So that's what we've been working on. And that's a net new part of the business that we've had to build out. And that I didn't know was going to be the problem. I don't think Scott did it either in the beginning. Um, so I think for all the founders on this call, it's not just your robot. Like what else has to be in place? And if your customer is the retailer, they don't have all those resources. So who are you partnering with? Who's integrating you? Who else is going to be there to make sure your system is working in the environment it was built to work in? And those are the nuances of your idea might be great and it might work, but it actually doesn't win because it can't get executed. So modularity, scalability, flexibility, it sounds like are kind of, at least on the hardware side, those are the, the keys oh, to the system. And, and those are things that are notoriously untrue in automation. Yes. <laughs> Flexibility, modularity, no. But Yuri really hit on something there is we early on developed the software to route the robots. But what we found is there was no overall software management system that could actually capitalize on the potential of our technology in, in delivering really disruptive change in supply chain. So the legacy software systems, we thought we were replacing the legacy hardware systems and we realized that there actually had to be a big build on replacing the software systems to actually get the most value out of the technology. So there's been a big investment on our side in intelligence and software that in the early days we didn't even realize we would need. Mm -hmm. um, but that adds to the overall value proposition. And the one thing that has evolved, like Atabotics hasn't really pivoted um, in any kind of traditional sense, we haven't moved away from anything that we've ever built and kind of scrapped anything. But what's evolved is that if we can do small systems and we, we design small systems so we can get our foot in the door, but now we can place those small systems in a fraction of the square footage closer to the consumer. We can start automating the back room and not just the warehouse. Mm -hmm. And then the intelligence needed to operate a bunch of small systems holistically, networked small systems, um, is has been the evolution of the product and the solution now. So we can go in and deliver, you know, network micro fulfillment supply chain uh, transitions to companies where they're still trying to figure out how the hell they would even do that. And we have, but that's been about, not about wanting to grow our IP portfolio or, or just tackle more. It's been, here's what we thought the problem is, but the problem actually turned into this, which is actually this. Yeah. And my team has been able to divide solutions to all of those problems. And so the question not becomes, you know, should we, it's like, why not us? We believe that we're at the forefront of this thinking for what modern consumers need, but the tools are beyond, as we mentioned earlier, really beyond robots. Um, robots are only as good as the intelligence that drives them. So uh, before we move on to the pitches, we've got a 
A good question from one of the viewers right now. Um, the question is, how did Forerunner discover adiabotics? Or maybe the question should be, who discovered whom? That's actually a good question. Um, we were mutually discovered through a retail partner that we both were closely with, uh, who at the time was doing a international RFP to think about the supply chain of the future. And they had turned over every stone, every nook and cranny in this whole wide world to figure out who are the players, what is, what would it look like if you started it from scratch and it was unbound. And they found Scott at some random conference and tracked him down and asked, what are you doing? He's like, got his robot under his arm. You know, it, it was that early. And they, they were brave enough to say, we want to we want to build it together. We want to, we want to be a part of this story. We, we want you to, we want you to build this. And with that, um, there was a commercial relationship that happened, but then also uh, an investment relationship. And then they called us and said, we came across this amazing company. Would you be interested? And at first it was robotics. i not really, but you know, then the, then the solution to the problem that was obvious. And then it was a, yeah, hell yeah. So um, it was very organic. We got, we got lucky, I think is the answer. Um, we More stately put, yes. <laughs> we all got lucky. Who got lucky? Everybody got lucky? Antibiotics yeah, definitely got lucky. Um, we come from a bizarre market. I'm in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. This is yeah. not a hotbed for supply chain automation. I'm not in Boston. I'm not in Silicon Valley. And exposure to early stage investors, especially visionary early stage investors, is challenging for some companies. Um, and most early stage investors, uh, you know, I was told, not by Yuri, but others, that they will not invest in a company that takes them more than 45 minutes to drive to to go yell at. So <laughs> we were kind of out of the geographic zone for early stage because it is very hands-on experience. It was pre-hybrid so, work. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, but having that common kind of connection through the customer mm -hmm. and having the customer willing to invest in the business and willing to, you know, buy the technology um, was was very fortunate for us yeah. and you you can't you know you can't take luck out of any equation and I can't stress this enough to any any entrepreneur anyone starting up luck is a big factor do everything you can to improve your luck and your chances um, and then when you presented with an opportunity make sure you're in your position to capitalize on it you got to be ready for when luck shows up um, the harder you work, the luckier you become. That doesn't guarantee you will be lucky. And we were lucky. And we continue to be lucky. Um, and, you know, timing is everything. Yeah. And uh, just be ready for it when it shows up. And if you work hard, it will. Great. Are you ready to see some pitches? Hell yeah. All right. Let's do this. Uh, let's bring on our first pitcher. We've got Morgan Chan of Astro Technologies. Uh, so just to run everybody through this real quickly, it's going to be a, a two minute long pitch. We're going to hear from three companies. And then after each one is done pitching, then uh, the two of you will get a four minute, four minutes for, for Q and a or and or advice for these, uh, these pitchers. And um, keep in mind, these are all, uh, we, we, we found these companies today. So this is, this is really Amazing. fresh, which, which should make it, I think all the more exciting. Cool. Do we have a, uh, Are you there, Morgan? Did I mention this is still really fresh? <laughs> 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 Cannot stress that enough. Got it. I can hear you, Morgan, but I can't see you. Good. Okay. We're going to bring up uh, Govind, Govind from uh, 10 Infinite Drones is the name of the company. Govind, are you there? There we go. All right. Hello. Hey, hey hi. Hey, hey so you, hey, thanks for joining. So, you know, you know, you know, the rough, rough deal. You're going to get a really quick countdown. You'll get two yeah. minutes to sure. tell us what you're doing. Perfect. Sure. All right. You're going to see a countdown pop up there. Three, two, one, go. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. My name is Govind. I'm calling from Bangalore, India. It's almost midnight here, but 
it's okay. This is a great opportunity. So we are 10 infinite drones. Uh, we built one of the smartest intelligent drone tech uh, for companies, for sectors like agriculture and uh, different other domains. We also build uh, UGVs or rovers for uh, custom solutions. Uh, the problem we are trying to solve is in India, we don't have any customized solution drones for various sectors. And uh, if we take agriculture, it's got a lot of different unorganized sectors and it's got a lot of unorganized environment. So we got to build drones that are relevant to certain areas and certain customized crops. That is exactly what we do as a solution. And uh, we have almost raised close to half a million dollars plus uh, as an investment now. Uh, we are making, we will, we are on track to make around hundred hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars this year. Uh, we're just under a year as a company. Um, we definitely are looking for, for future investments and we'll definitely pitch you back. Thank you so much. Great. All right. Very succinct. Um, Yuri, you want to kick us off? So as is my usual MO, um, who are you selling to and what is the yeah. problem that they're trying to solve with the drones? So basically, we are, our end users are contract farmers or the farmers uh, in India. Uh, as you know, 60% of our land is agriculture, which is quite unorganized. Um, and uh, these contract farmers are a part of large multi-corporation companies. So we get into a contract with companies like ITC, Tata, uh, and different other global companies. And then we work with these companies to propose our product solutions and device spraying solutions, data and yield assessment that is required uh, for the supply and the, uh, the cost saving, the operational costs that we reduce through our operations. So if I were to understand this correctly, you're not really making mm -hmm. drones, you're making the intelligence for specific market sectors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're doing, you know, mapping, pre-planning to better utilize fertilizer or herbicide, planning yeah. like that. And so the ROI on this is actually what they save yep. uh, in chemicals application process because of the intelligence that is provided in advance of that, that process. Is that, is that That's right? True. That's true. Yep. Excellent. And so what differentiates your technology? Because I'm assuming sure. it's not a drone. You can put that on any drone platform. Yeah, that's, a fair, that's what, a fair question. That's a fair question. Why Why? you? Why sure. you? I'll give you one example, right? For example, uh, Weber Solutions that basically saves a couple of gallons of water uh, for several acres that we cover, which is not possible for other companies uh, that are probably willing to do the same applications. In India, it's quite unorganized because we all depend on other developed countries for procurement and purchase. But what we try and understand is there are simple applications um, that we have patented that basically helps in smart spraying applications, which will save both chemical and water while spraying. They're not all over the place. They go specifically on crops and it's different for different crops. In India, coffee is different uh, when you compare coffee to Brazil. So then we build rovers with a combination of drones. So that is where we get more customized and, and specific to the problem. And then we build it in mass. I think what Scott was also trying to get at is the financial math that happens mm -hmm. for your customers. So what are they mm -hmm. saving in what time frame compared sure. to what cost of, of the drone? So basically our cost of recovery, uh, we actually get into services uh, when we manufacture drones. So we charge cost per acre. Uh, that basically um, our break even is if we cover like hundreds of acres or let's call it 100 hectares or 500 hectares, we have covered our costs, uh, which is the cost of our manufacturing. Because it's in India, we keep the cost quite low when we build our things ourselves and we put out our pilots. So basically, our cost of operations are covered in several acres we do. As we go in volumes, our profit our profit, uh, and revenue goes up as a company. Is, is farming different in India than the rest of the world? Absolutely. It's it's quite very, very different. So um, you're, saying, and, you're saying your only opportunity for this technology then is Indian agriculture. There's no other... No, there, is, there are properties, uh, which is uh, solutions for the global world. Why we are focused on Indian market is it's a very unorganized space uh, that requires a lot of innovation. And if we can do this in India, we can do it anywhere in the world. 
because farming and agriculture is quite organized in us and other markets so that's what we believe when there is not when there is no organized sector there's an opportunity uh, that we can address yeah great great we are unfortunately out of time but govin that's sure, great sure, thank no you problem. for joining us thank you for i'll write to you guys yeah. soon yeah. thank you so much for the opportunity i'll yeah. write to you guys soon yeah, thanks. Thank you. I, I saw I saw everybody's eyes light up with that last bit about if we can basically if the the Frank Sinatra thing if we can do it here we can do it anywhere. Right? <laughs> yeah. Thanks for right. your time, guys. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Much. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we are we're gonna try Morgan again. Morgan, buddy, can we swap Govins out for Morgan? All right, let's give this another shot. Hopefully Morgan is not selling us some sort of video conferencing technology <laughs> and we'll not be buying it from him. Morgan, are you there? Tech founders gotta learn how to use Zoom, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna and start my own countdown clock. Blue Dean and WebEx and yeah. hey, hey, hey. there we go. All right, Morgan, thank you for joining us. Um, we are, as I said before, we're going to give you uh, two minutes of pitch, four minutes for Q&A. You're going to see countdown clock. Should be popping up there. Three, two, one, go. Ah, nope. Oh. Let's, let's, get, let's get your sound on, Morgan. You're, you're just you're muted, muted on your end. You're, you're muted in Zoom there. Clock is running. Okay. All right. All right. So let's about go. that. Yeah, hi. Uh, we are, uh, we'll make it short. We develop mobile robots uh, for cargo loading to solve more the, the most labor intensive and time consuming part of warehouse processes. Uh, the idea came about when everyone was working from home. And so, it's my wife, since my wife is in the logistic industry, uh, I was I was overheard how she, how her customer are unable to load containers and always lack of workers deal with the constraint of supply chain issue. So it dug further into the possibility of robot handling uh, the dock and loading. Uh, to my surprise, there's a few companies that are in development, but none of them deployed. So late last year, uh, I began you know, to dig further into uh, developing mobile robots uh, so uh, through the past 15 years, I was working overseas through, you know, mostly developing electronics and I was able to uh, partner with a few companies that we are currently in development uh, of the mobile robots and currently is in beta stage. Uh, and some luck is my wife were able to introduce a few pilot customers, uh, which will begin pilot program in a few months. Uh, but the main point doesn't validate uh, the market needs for the robot. So a few weeks ago, uh, I began some quick lit ads and lo and behold, you know, we will sign up around two customers per week for pilot programs. Uh, we've realized and found basic traction and we are solving a pain point which businesses are willing to pay up to $5,000 a month to alleviate part of the warehouse operations. Uh, we will begin sending out two robots for part pilot in the next few months. And as of date, we have over half a million ARR booking uh, just from the pilot program customers alone. Uh, hopefully we'll begin a production and starting the first quarter next year and begin our second phase for Astro. All right, I'm gonna let Scott take this one first because I, I can't imagine a pitch that's more, I mean, outside of like, Good. you know, long, <laughs> long boards. It's right in your wheelhouse. I want to understand you are doing the case, like unpacking of shipping containers. Is that, yes. is that right? Yes. Um, and you're doing it with, with AMRs. Oh, uh, yes. AMR, exactly. Yeah. That have, exactly. So have you often do the, the delivery after it leaves the container. Uh, yeah. Well, basically like into the warehouse or, or someplace. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for uh, unloading boxes from cargo containers. So I understand why you want to address this from a labor constraint point of view, you know, getting the containers unloaded, getting them into the supply chain is key and labor is a huge challenge if they're manually unloaded. Um, how does your solution compare to some of the larger integrated dock solutions that are doing automated case unloading now? Because you're talking about a modular AMR based versus kind of, you know, bigger robotic solution. How's yours different? Uh, as, uh, first of all, ours is mobile, uh, you know, as, and second of all, is extremely intuitive. It's basically, uh, we have 
a touchpad at the back of the robot, which, uh, you know, direct the robot and Franklin can and press go, and that's basically it. And our price is, I guess, is the most attractive perspective is uh, through a pilot program, uh, we are charging customers 5000 a month uh, to unload as many, you know, containers as they could, you know, as, as the robot able to handle. Uh, so from a cost, pers cost constraint perspective, it's extremely attractive to a lot of our uh, pilot customers. Yuri? When you think about that customer base, um, who it's great that your wife has access to some pilot customers. I think those are the advantages you have to exploit as an early stage founder. So that's great. And I love the scrappiness of just pulling up Craigslist and posting it to see, you know, what the response is, because that that's it. You've got to be scrappy and hack around. And just the, the fact that you've got some um, ARR getting going just with the pilot is uh, is awesome. So, I mean, I think what Scott's also trying to get at is, you know, who who's the sweet spot customer? Because there's, uh, it, it sounds like the price point's interesting, but usually what ends up happening if price is too interesting is that it's not good for you. Your margins are not good enough. So prices are going to have to go up as you scale. So how do you think about, like, if you're the solution for this particular part of the market, what what would that part be? Like, who's the um, of people? We, uh, since, you know, tons of competitors, especially like, you know, Boston Dynamics, they're a top-down approach. Our, uh, our thinking is more of a bottom-up approach. So we, we target virtually any importers or uh, third-party logistic company that handles, you know, around 20 container plus a month. Uh, they, they could definitely utilize a system, you know, uh, with, you know, money to spare. So that is basically our approach. And uh, most of our public customers, they are mostly, you know, third-party logistics. We've got a few uh, importers of... Uh, utensils and, uh, you know, wholesalers and so forth. So, you know, our sweet spot is mostly right now, at least uh, what we've seen in our uh, pilot customers are mostly third-party logistics and small medium size importers. How does your productivity compare to, to manual labor? Great question. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is a great question. Uh, well, currently is we are picking around 600 pieces per hour. Uh, that is definitely not up to part in terms of human, but uh, you know, uh, as of the you know as of the uh, AI basically improved, we could definitely pick a lot faster. Since I'm able to pick around approximately, you know, uh, I would say able to do around I would say around close to thousand boxes per hour. But the AI itself right now is definitely uh, not at the level yet, but we eventually we will reach there. Box every four seconds, impressive, sir. If you're if you're able to do that, keep going. Absolutely. Yeah, hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, that was thank great. You. All right. So let's bring um, Hubert Chan. I no relation as, as far as I know. We got a, <laughs> another Chad coming up next. Um, while we wait for Hubert, um, you know, one of the things that, that struck me as interesting is is he Morgan really tied it to this, this personal story, you know, and, and, and as we were having the conversation with Scott earlier, you know, obviously Scott's got this really interesting founding story. Is that, is that something that's kind of, that attracts you to a startup? You know, I, I think so. And, and really it's not the story necessarily, but just the, the question of why are you starting this company? Because if you're just sort of thinking about an idea and decided you were going to pick a robotics company, it, that's not going to lead to a very successful outcome because you don't know anything about the industry. But if you had a personal story and you have a connection to it and it taps like the resources that you have, I think that leads more towards why you're the right founder to solve this problem. Yuri once told me that she wasn't investing in an idea. She was investing in my ability to realize that idea. So I think people matter at the early stage. They're all you have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until they're replaced by robots. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> Founder robots. Who's making that company? Yeah. H Hubert, uh, we have you. Yep. Are you, can you mute? Oh, let me, there we go. All right. Oh, no. You muted himself. One more time. You mute yeah. yourself again there. All right. Say hi. Hey, I don't think we can hear you. I'm not getting anything. Yeah. One more time. I think saying anything. There we go. Turn, if you could turn it up a little bit on your end, if that's possible. One, two, three. Yeah, you got it. Okay. All right. Cool. So, and then, and and maybe just project a little bit because you're you're still a little bit low. So, um, here's the deal. You're going to get two minutes to pitch, and then uh, you well, three, two, one, <laughs> go. 
Hi, my name is Hubert Chen. I'm the founder of Helpful Online Turing and Helpful SaaS. Um, I started this business because I used to struggle with homework assignments in the middle of the night. But right now, we are specialized in um, subjects such as debate and computer science. We have over six figures uh, profit and 95% retention rate. Um, right now, we are considering a pivot. Um, last year, during a strict lockdown, several businesses reached out and asked us if we can build them a platform that is similar to Helpful SaaS platform. They have to use so many different software to keep their business uh, productive remotely. They have to use uh, Zoom for video conferencing, uh, PayPal for billing, Calendly for scheduling. The list goes on. It's pretty uh, difficult to run a business uh, online remotely, as you can imagine. But this is actually a huge market. There are more than 87 uh, million small to medium sized businesses in Hong Kong and America. And at my SaaS platform, they will be able to create a robust web application with all of the tools they need in one place under one roof. For example, we have a scheduling feature to facilitate um, third party communication and a video conferencing feature with a timer and a payment integrated with it and a, um, and a learning management system and also a multi-language user interface for international businesses. At Helpful, we believe the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And we are uniquely qualified to run this business because we have been running a up and coming online touring platform for several years with uh, six, uh, uh, six figures net profit. At Helpful, we wanted to let everyone know that an expert is just a few clicks away. All right. So I was going to let Yuri go first, but I saw Scott crack a smile there about halfway through. I, I saw you, I, I saw, I saw you thinking of something and preparing that question. So I'm going to actually let you start. I agree with you, Hubert, and I say this was a very well rehearsed pitch. You can see you've done it a number of times, um, and that's refreshing. Why is yours different than the other big companies that are trying to solve the same problems? Why you, why not Zoom, why not Teams? Because they're all working on similar aspects. What makes your solution special and how will you take on those more entrenched, bigger organizations? Yes, great question. First, we have a unique timer connected to the... Um, a payment system, for example, an attorney or a teacher can have a lesson for one minute and uh, one, one hour and 15 minutes, then the credit card system will be able to charge this, uh, the client exactly the right amount. That is going to save so much administrative cost with Zoom and Teams. They don't really have a payment integrated with um uh, the, the, with the credit card. And we also have a learning management system that will automatically store clients text messages and files. With Zoom, you often have to save every messages at the end of the uh, conference call, but everything will be deleted at the end. So uh, that's not the best user experience. If I can actually piggyback on that real quick, is, what is defensible about your technology? You know, What's to stop Zoom from coming in if your product is successful and repeating it? Um, yeah, so we will create an online digital presence for um, international businesses. Zoom is more like a communicative um, communication tool, but there are so many businesses who need an online presence for a uh, multi-language uh, audience. Um, so a combination of these fe features will be able to uh, give us uh, a head start, you know. Um, I think Brian's question was, you got any IP that protects you from get, having them just doing what you're doing? Um, well, um, I, I think, you know, um, as entrepreneur, we have to be diligent. And, you know, uh, if a team with more uh, resources come after us, we will just need to um, work harder and punch above our weight. Get a patent attorney, my friend. <laughs> okay. I think the answer was no, there was no IP, Scott. Yes, get, um, a, get a patent attorney. You know, Hubert, I would um, I would offer some advice versus a question here because I think when you started the pitch, you spent you know fifteen or twenty seconds talking about the tutoring platform, and it really kind of got me thinking about a really different topic matter. So when then when you said you were pivoting, I said, okay, you just told me a bunch of great stats about this tutoring company, but obviously it's not working because you're pivoting. Now I got to like reframe and think about this whole other business. 
I understand that this company came out of your existing work and knowledge and customer need from the tutoring company, but I might just start from the, the, the company that you're selling now. And at the end of the pitch say, you know, why us? Well, we've been doing this. We've been hacking around for three years doing this tutoring company. And like, it really evolved out of a customer need. And so now we're, we're addressing a broader landscape and a broader need set versus just the actual content of the tutoring. Thank you. It's when you think about it, anyone that's offering like their individual professional services um, certainly has a need for what you're talking about to simplify the workflow and work streams. Most of the ones that come to mind are subscription models right now where you have access to professionals um, for content. Um, but when it comes to when you talk about lawyers and stuff like that, um, the th first thing that came to mind was OnlyFans. Um, <laughs> made huge revenues, but make sure you understand the demographic you're going off there, the problem you're solving, um, and how you're going to approach the market. Um, and understand too, that the best thing you can do is create a moat around yourself with some IP. So they have to come. And don't, and don't pivot away from the one thing that's making you money. <laughs> it's the lessons of only fans. <laughs> yes. Right, well, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Huber, thank you so much for joining us. Good luck, Hubert. Thanks. Good luck. Thank right. you. All right. And that uh, that about wraps us up for the week. Um, another reminder real quick. So we've got a Twitter space coming up. I will be back on in an hour. We will continue the conversation about robotics and TC Robotics is coming up uh, a week from tomorrow. Uh, so Scott and Yuri, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Brian. Brian. Thanks, Scott. Bye. Thanks, Yuri. See you later. Thanks, everybody.